Welcome to the Professional Incorporation of Advisors or Directed Commissions, Is There a Difference and Should You Care? webinar. It's quite a mouthful of a title. Uh, my name is Marshall Beyer, and I am the Senior Director at the Canadian Securities Institute. And I will just take a moment to introduce this webinar and the speakers and panelists. First, I am obligated to say that information contained herein are statements of opinion and not statements of fact or recommendations to purchase, sell, or hold any securities or to provide legal or tax advice. We ask that no one record this webinar without Moody's explicit written permission. Lastly, no one has permission to quote any of the comments made or questions asked by the webinar audience. Today's webinar is being recorded and the recording will be made uh, available in coming days on our website. Um, all members of the audience are currently on mute. If you have a question, and we strongly encourage you to uh, put forth your questions, please type them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. Our, our uh, participants in this webinar will answer the questions after the initial presentation, which will last uh, around 20 to 30 minutes. We ask that you please keep your questions as generic as possible and avoid personal or client-specific information. The issue of, of advisor incorporation has been with us for many years and even decades. What has brought it to the forefront recently, and also convinced CSI to hold this for, forum, is the upcoming merger of IROC and the MFDA, and the CSA stated objective of harmonizing the different approaches to this issue that IROC and MFDA take. To present, discuss, and maybe debate a little bit this topic, we have an expert panel and would of course very much value the audience to actively join the conversation through your questions. Sean Shore is a graduate of the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Law and the London School of Economics and is a, is a lawyer with the Canadian Compliance and Regulatory Law where he has practiced since 2014. He is a former CCO of a large independent in investment dealer. His current practice is focused on the regulation of individuals and corporations that are registered in the Canadian investment industry. As part of that role, he has worked and consulted with regulators in the area of advisor incorporation. Philip, Philip Akers is a CPA and leading practice management specialist who has honed his skills over 30 years in the investment business. His mandate is simple, to help position advisors for growth and their ability to redefine their business. Phil helped develop the North American Wealth Practice Management Strategy at one of the big banks, designed to drive results, efficiency, and profitability for all wealth businesses, leaders, and advisors. He has more recently worked on the MFDA and insurance sides of the street in a similar capacity, but that also includes working with incorporated advisors. We are very lucky also to have here Chris Enright. Chris is the founding partner, president, and managing director of Aligned Capital Partners, an IROC dealer that was built with the goal of creating an industry-leading technology platform combined with operational excellence to increase the bandwidth of, a, of an advisor's practice so they have more time to focus on improving investor outcomes. Christopher also recognizes his responsibility to shape the regulatory landscape and ensure the voice of independent client-focused advisors and their clientele are heard, and in that role has been actively involved in the advisor incorporation discussion. So with that, I will turn it over to Sean for the presentation. Thank you very much, Marshall. It's great to be here and welcome to all our attendees. Uh, we can uh, move forward to the next slide, please. So here's our agenda for today. Uh, and at a high level, I think the panel is really excited to uh, open this conversation up and really create and promote discussion on this issue, which is very important to the industry. As Marshall mentioned, it's something that has been uh, talked about for many, many years. Um, and I think the the un upcoming merger and consolidation of uh, the MFT and IROC has really brought this issue forward for um, uh, recognizing that this issue really needs to be um, uh, managed going forward. And, and hopefully uh, through this type of dialogue, we can get feedback and really get a better understanding of, of where the, what the industry is feeling and, and where we're going. So with that, <clears throat> uh, we're going to be going over uh, existing current options for registrants, uh, whether or not, uh, whether or not you should as, look at incorporating your practice, um, whether it be, 
um, directing commissions or formally incorporating it. And obviously one of them uh, requires a bit more work on uh, the industry's part, the current state of affairs. And then of course, what, what happens next? So we can go to the next slide. And then there we are. And so by way of introduction, as we've already heard, the incorporated professional is really not a new concept. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. And right now, this is something that has existed for other professions uh, for many, many years. In fact, for, for decades, uh, lawyers, physicians, engineers, social workers, architects, land surveyors, geoscientists, um, uh, physiotherapists in some jurisdictions. So it really has come and spread out to a lot of quote unquote professions. And this is obviously a very jurisdictionally sensitive issue because each profession will have its own governing legislation as well as be managed through uh, legislation in each province. So lawyers are regulated in both in, in every province and, and the legislation in each province is different. For the most part, lawyers and doctors, as an example, throughout Canada have, have the privilege, the opportunity to incorporate. As I said, this is something that has to be permitted under governing legislation in order for it to happen uh, in the first place. Traditionally, what we're all familiar with is that the professional, it, him, him or herself, has the license or possesses the registration to practice in that area, to practice law, medicine, engineering, or what have you. It's, it was typically an, a human being that had that license. And only over the last 30-ish years, did the professional incorporate the, the incorporated professional emerge as a separate licensee under these uh, under this legislation? So we can see the next slide, please. So where did this all come from it is an interesting conversation, one which we could probably talk about for, for hours, but back way, way, way back when this issue came about because uh, of taxation cases, actually. Um, and you have a couple of cases back, I think, in the 60s or 70s, where physicians sought to take their fees that they were earning and put them in the hands of a company. And uh, the case law did not support that. Ultimately, these were tax cases. And so that is the, the genesis of this issue. And, and really, at the time, phys physicians were saying, look, we recognize that the ability to incorporate, say, for example, uh, your barbershop or another business owner, that is something that we too, as physicians, or as professionals, we think that that's a privilege that we should have. We're business owners after, after all. And this is something that we should, uh, we should have the opportunity to do. And, and taking a step back and looking through at this through a tax lens, the language that is often kicked around is taxpayers having the ability to organize their affairs in the most uh, tax efficient manner possible. That was never really a possibility for the professional because they didn't have the right to incorporate in the first place. So what happens in, in professional legislation across the country, so for example, if we just focus on the medical profession, uh, whether it's called the Medical Act or the Physicians and Surgeons legislation or whatever it's called in your province, the solution was really to license or extend a permit to practice to a corporation which would be provided for under that particular uh, body of legislation. So if you had a physician practicing as Mr. X, it was services provided by uh, the, the Mr. X medical corporation. And it was the medical corporation that had to be granted a permit. And under that model, the corporation in question actually was licensed. And that's how this issue was, was solved. And as a result, as I note down there, and, and if you've ever gone to a physician's office or a doctor's office or an accountant's office, and you get an invoice, it'll say services provided by the ABC Law Corporation, as an example. So as a result, the professional corporation in question practices through the human being, through the professional, the doctor, uh, that is authorized to render those types of services and, and provide medical advice and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So the other the other rub here is that it's it's a little bit more complicated than I'm just going to go out as a professional as a as a lawyer and incorporate a company. Um, I can't just do that, uh, given that the regulator for me is going to want to have a look at that corporation before the corporation is granted that permit. I have to make sure that I'm incorporating the, the company with a certain DNA, as I call it. And this is just an example. I went to I went to legislation here in Manitoba and looked at what was uh, 
what was required here. And, and really it speaks to, well, who can be a shareholder for starters? Can that just be, uh, can that just be a doctor? Can non-physicians hold shares? What about family members? What about holding companies? Can you have a, a hold co structure? What about family trusts? These are the types of things that are spoken to in the legislation, which is different on a province by province basis. So uh, at a very high level, those who are considering incorporating, if it becomes available uh, after, after the merger and probably uh, into phase two or three of the consolidation, uh, they'll obviously have guidance from their firm and from the regulator about what that corporation has to look like. But for other professions, it is highly, highly prescriptive. So who can be a shareholder? who can be an officer or director. And when I say shareholder, I mean voting shareholder. Um, are there restrictions on voting arrangements like uh, unanimous shareholders agreements? And then the most important part, which is, which is often the focus of a conversation, is what happens to the liability of the professional in question? And the answer quite clearly is nothing. It doesn't change. The fact that I have interposed a corporation between myself and my practice changes absolutely nothing to, about whether or not I can be called to task by my regulator, sued by a client for negligence or professional negligence. So that changes nothing. My, my status as a professional and how I practice is, is not changed one bit by the fact that I am using a corporate structure. So, um, and, and, and really what, what happens there is that the, the ultimate end point is that this is really an economic solution which is what that comment I made earlier uh, about the physicians in the 50s and 60s saying we want the, the privilege to do this because it's an economically beneficial to us. And that's really the outcome here is that all things being considered equal, other than being able to organize my affairs more tax efficiently, uh, nothing else has changed. And I'll just pause there for a second and, and uh, I'll, I'll say to Phil and, and Chris, if, if there's any uh, ever a point to interject, feel free to come in with color commentary and we can go to the next slide, please. So here are the current options for, uh, for uh, the universe that we're talking about. So we'll start with IROC. So uh, those on the call from IROC, we know that you can, you can, um, you can exist as an employee uh, with your dealer. So standard uh, employment law considerations apply. You sign, uh, you sign a, an employment contract. Um, you can be terminated uh, with or without cause type of thing. And, and you're, you're, you're an ordinary employee like everyone else is. You can also go via principal, the principal agent arrangement, which is a little bit different. You're not employed. You're an independent contractor. As they say, there's, there are some tax benefits there. Um, and then finally, uh, there is no professional incorporation opportunity or uh, opportunity to direct commissions under the current IROC platform. So next slide, please. Now, the MFD is a little bit different. Uh, first two are still the same. You can go employer, employee, you can go principal agent, but there is also an opportunity for MFDA registrants currently, and which has existed for probably, I think, the past 20 or so years to direct commissions, or co they call it income redirect. Um, uh, and we'll get into what that means in a second, uh, which is a sort of hybrid model of incorporating my practice now. And I'll make a quick note here that this is not permitted currently in Alberta and hasn't been for quite some time. So next slide, please. And, and this is where we'll get into the meat of it on the MFDA side. So what happens here is that uh, MFDA registrants can take their commissions that they're earning. So let's remember, I'm licensed as an MFDA registrant. And I earn my, my commissions uh, based on the advice and trading that uh, I've given. Uh, and then I can take those commissions and I can direct them to a company, my company. Uh, so very similar to an incorporated, a formal incorporated professional, but not quite the same. Um, in, in a professional incorporation structure, there are prohibitions like the, like, uh, sorry, pardon me, like in an, an incorporated professional structure, there are prohibitions baked into the directed commissions model. And I've got the rule reference there as well as the prescribed form of agreement that has to be executed between the dealer member. Uh, which is the MFDA dealer member, the registrant, which would be the salesperson, and then the payee corporation, which is the salesperson corporation. So that agreement is part of this model that has to be executed in order for the registrant, me, to take advantage of my opportunity to income redirect or redirect my commissions that I've earned to my company. 
And these, these requirements or conditions include uh, books and records requirements, um, uh, constraints as to ownership, and so on. So very similar to what I've described earlier, but not quite the same. So next slide, please. For insurance registrants, uh, employer-employee, um, and they are, uh, they have had and do have the ability to incorporate their practice. And similar to, I believe, and, and Phil might be able to shed some light on this, to, I believe like a formal incorporated model, when I have an insurance company that can receive my uh, insurance commissions, that company actually has a license and is registered to receive those commissions under that license, unlike a, unlike a redirect type model. Uh, next slide. Phil is nodding, so I, I believe that's correct. Okay. Uh, so, so now we're going to get into the the meat of things a little bit here, and and really, what's what are the difference between these two? What's the difference between a formal incorporation that uh, I've talked about uh, lawyers and doctors can do and accountants versus redirecting my commission? So, on the professional incorporation side, we have the corporation is registered and licensed, and the income is earned directly by the company. Um, in addition to that, the professional is also licensed. So, exactly what we've just talked about, the directed commission side. We have the salesperson registered, so the human being, me in this case, and the income is earned by that person, say, so far so good, and then I take it and I redirect it to the corporation under that agreement that I've mentioned uh, that's in place through the MFDA model. The corporation itself is not licensed. Uh, the corporation really acts as a conduit to receive that income and nothing more. Um, so that's really the difference between the two. Next slide, please. So in terms of tax considerations, um, uh, it's, it's always a good idea to speak to your professional tax advisor. The person who files your tax return, this is somebody who you want to have a conversation with to, to make sure that either redirecting your commissions to a company, uh, or if there's an opportunity to incorporate professionally, formally, that you have that conversation before you do this. And this is something that, that advisors uh, should prob will probably know the answer. I hope they know the answer to whether or not their practice can support uh, an incorporated model. But the tax considerations, these are not, uh, these are not, not going to come as a surprise to anybody. You, you're under a corporate, an incorporated model, whether it's a professional incorporation or directing commissions, you're going to have access to the small business deduction, as well as the accompanying tax deferral. You're going to have some capital, capital gains exemption opportunities uh, by virtue of the qualified small business corporation shares um, on the, and I, and I put this in there because it's going to come up later in the presentation, but the tax status of directed commissions really is, is not as clear as we would like it to be. So that's, that's the one thing that, you know, I think when I'm, because this issue has come up a lot lately, given the move to uh, the, the consolidation of uh, the MFD and IROC, and the conversations are starting, especially on the IROC side, well, what happens if we get the directed commission opportunity? What happens? Should we do this? Should we not do this? What's the tax status? So I think that's, that's a live issue for people to consider uh, before they do this. In terms of the legal considerations, and, and again, this is applicable to regardless of how you structure your affairs, you, you have limited liability, but this is not going to be in any way helpful to you in terms of professional negligence or regulatory misconduct. Uh, the usually you're going to have startup and ongoing costs. You're going to have to file another tax return for the company. The ownership uh, requirements are going to be uh, imposed upon you as stipulated in, in legislation, whether it's through the MFDA or otherwise. And, um, and this really does not really change at all who owns or controls your book of business. Uh, again, this is just an economic outcome. Next slide, please. Philip, over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Sean. Uh, very much appreciated. And, and uh, Sean says, thanks to everybody for uh, attending today. From a practice management, and that's really the, the approach that I want to take here. When I think about advisors, when I think about some of the current realities here uh, within the business, uh, whether it be IROC, MFDA, certainly on, uh, certainly on the investment side, security side, you know, what I think about the businesses themselves, and I think about advisors today, and, and the first bullet you see here, I mean, there's an absolute requirement here to run your practice like a business. Now, albeit that's not aligned specifically to do you incorporate or not, um, but it really comes back to what Sean, I think you were talking about earlier, and that is when I look about 
you know, for the, one of the comments that you made was, you know, organize uh, folks should have business owners, doctors, and so on. Um, everybody should have the opportunity to organize their affairs in the most efficient way possible. That's really what I think about here. Uh, so when I talk about business owner, I mean, we've got some fantastic advisors out there, no question. Uh, and and what, again, whether you're IROC, MFDA doesn't really matter. But I think with the industry today, uh, the, the absolute requirement to run your practice like a business owner um, is, is absolutely there. I think about the complexity of it. I think about you know, what, what client, uh, clients are looking for, one advisor who can manage various different aspects of, of, uh, of their life, of their business, uh, so to speak. And I'm certainly aligning to you know, the, the mass affluent and, and high net worth space here. Um, but, and the other thing that I would say here is that from a corporation point of view, or as Sean has called out, it isn't really, I mean, it isn't for everybody, nor should it be for everybody. I mean, when I look at those advisors who are growing their practices, growing their earnings, that's where I think some of those efficiencies start to come into play. Uh, from, whether it be from a tax perspective or a couple of other things that I will refer to uh, just in a, later on. The other thing I think about here is, you know, it aligns to sound financial planning advice. I mean, we, many, many advisors have business owners as clients and, or whether they, again, they be incorporated or not, you know, every day they are providing sound, that what I'm referring to as sound financial planning advice to business owner clients talking around the benefits of incorporating, whether it be some of the references that Sean has already made, the capital gains deduction, uh, dividend versus salary and, and so on. This is advice that they're providing to their clients. They know it's sound advice. They know it makes sense. And again, ties back to that whole idea of building their business in a very, very efficient way. Um, when I talk about enables the desire and requirement to scale and grow, comes back to this idea of uh, from an industry side of things, they, the whole approach here of maybe advisors operating on their own there is, is becoming more and more challenging. The requirement to create teams, to expand, to grow, to create some scale here, whether that be from a, from a client, uh, ideal client perspective or uh, just how folks set their practice, it does truly align very nicely to a requirement here to scale and grow, as I say. Uh, from a next slide perspective, please. Um, the other thing that I think about from a practice management side is when I do look at team and, and as I referred to the requirements here, almost the, the industry requirements for, for advisors to, to build and to grow scale uh, really talks to the idea of team. And so the comment here, team members typically are employees of the corp versus the firm. firm. What I mean by that is if you think about incorporated advisors, not necessarily, or would they typically be uh, employees of a firm like they would be in maybe more of an employer employee relationship where an assistant and associate and so on may be also a, uh, a also a, um, a, a an employee of the firm uh, themselves so when i think about the flexibility i think about the ability for advisors to run their practice to set their team structures with uh with, with an incorporated advisor with those individuals being uh, members of or employees of that corporation versus the firm it does give added flexibility for them to uh to really structure their teams now of course firms are going to have a say as far as what that looks like and and uh you know how how commissions are paid and so on and that's entirely up to the to the firms to do that but at the end of the day uh again more flexibility tends to line up sean what you were talking about as well as far as the liability side of things shareholders and who can be shareholders and albeit uh, you know much of that is driven by whether it be provincial regulators or whoever the case may be uh, the whole idea of the limited liability side and then how the advisors work uh, you know, certainly can be solved for by things like a three-way agreement. In other words, this is an agreement between the firm and the advisor, but also with the corp. So it kind of wraps everything all together. So everybody is, to your earlier point, singing off the same song sheet here, and they have to sing off the same song sheet uh, for sure. The other thing that I think about here is, and I've referred it to as succession and advisor retirement planning. One of the key 
challenges, I will say, or key realities, I, I think, within the industry. And again, whether this is MFDA, IROC, doesn't really matter. Uh, when you look at the age uh, of existing advisors, there's lots of stats out there that says over the next five years, next 10 years, you know, the percentage of advisors who potentially are looking to retire is, um, is, is you know, significant and certainly one thing that is worth noting. I think about the ability to incorporate, I think about the impact from a succession point of view. I think about the, you know, the consistency that is created from a client, from a branding side of things, the ability uh, for uh, advisors to identify successors and partner with successors and, and really have those, uh, those financial um, considerations uh, already in place as it relates to the benefits of being uh, both shareholders or assigning or allowing you know, successors to purchase shares within the organization and so on. And therefore, upon uh, the, the opportunity for succession or the retirement of one advisor, it, it makes it a little bit cleaner as opposed to, you know, managing as true partnerships and so on and, and all the challenges thereof. Uh, the consistency of brand, of course, ABC and Inc., uh, would, uh, regardless of the advisor um, or at other individuals joining the team, that all is very, very consistent as well. Um, the other thing I would say, and, and Sean, again, comes back to one of the things that you said, this, this is not without cost, right? This is not without uh, added layers of complexity. So I will come back to this idea that says it, it, is, it is not for everybody. It's not necessarily for a newer advisor starting out or for an individual who, who wants to maintain a, a very tight and, and small Small, uh, small practice, but for those who are truly looking to grow and, and those who are looking to expand their capabilities and truly take advantage of the uh, uh, of the opportunities here or advantages and the efficiencies of uh, of incorporation, um, yeah, in many many cases it will outweigh the uh, potential issues or challenges or the, the challenges that come along or the added considerations that come along from an incorporation side. So again, just some things from a practice management, from an advisor perspective that, uh, that I truly think about for sure. That's great. And next you. slide. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, back over to me and, and this is a, this is a good slide because I think that uh, it's, it's incumbent on each individual to have these conversations with their firm before they go down this path, uh, have a conversation with your tax planner, your tax professional, have a conversation with your firm. Uh, what comes up a lot is who, do, who owns these clients? Does, it, does that change by virtue of the fact that I incorporate my business or redirect my commissions? And, and of course, the answer is no, it doesn't. Um, the clients are the clients, and I think the case law supports us in knowing that clients have uh, freedom of mobility, and they can go wherever they want, they can choose whoever they want. And, uh, and, and I think the, the recent moves in the industry uh, all support that, that clients are in, entitled to be with their advisor wherever that advisor is. Um, and to to sort of play games with that is is dangerous. Um, so that does so incorporation doesn't change that at all. <clears throat> this you know my concern here about competitive disadvantages is is when when we get to the destination of of the amalgamation of the of the MFD and IROC, and if you have some firms wading into this pool saying yeah you know what we're gonna we're gonna go down this path of offering offering um, incorporation or the the uh, commission redirect and some that don't. I think that's going to create um, a competitive advantage between firms and or platforms. Um, so I think that that is something that is very, very important for, for everyone to keep, keep, uh, keep their eye on. You know, the other thing that we haven't really talked about uh, yet, and I mentioned it there is, um, is, is uh, advising representatives on the, on the portfolio management side or, or EMDs dealing representatives and how they fit into this. And, and they presently obviously are regulated directly by, this, by CSA members, um, but the documentation that was submitted by the CSA in support of the amalgamation of the, of, uh, the MFT and IROC does contemplate in phase three, I believe, maybe it's phase eight or nine once, once we get there, because this is a long, a long runway, that, that potentially that plat, those platforms could come under this regulator, this centralized regulator. And if, if that's the case, then, then the same conversation is going to have to happen with respect to those platforms. Uh, yes, the rules still apply to you. Whether you're operating your business under a corporation or not, the rules still apply to you. You're still licensed. Your license is still sponsored by your firm. That, that truth does not change. 
Uh, and of course, the desire here is to level the playing field. And, and that's what I think the industry is really hoping for, fingers crossed, that we eliminate um, the opportunity to platform shop, which platform is different. And, and, and as well as that, to make sure that the client experience is, I, I want to start by saying similar, if not identical, to whether or not I choose to get service serviced by a portfolio manager, an IROC broker, an MFTA broker, an EMD, whatever. Uh, my experience as a client should be identical. Next slide, please. Yeah, Sean, I was just going to add there that I, I think that that's a really important point. And, and you know, the CSA and in, in, in looking at this in a, in a phased approach and starting with merging or amalgamating uh, the MFDA and IROC, um, you know, that represents a large, large portion of the client facing advisors. And I think that, that, that that's a key point to bring up, I think. I think in order to improve investor outcomes, um, reducing the amount of client confusion should be at the forefront while these decisions are being made. So I, I think that this is an opportunity for the industry to use this amalgamation as sort of that point in time to get it right, sort of measure twice and cut once and fix this issue once and for all. Um, it, so that we aren't talking about it for another decade or so, that, that, that we are moving forward with, with a solution that is very easy to articulate to the end client so that they know that who they're dealing with. And I, and I just wanted to add one point to what, what Philip has said. I think he is 100% right in terms of from a practice management perspective. The, the, the days on the IROC side of that traditional stockbroker, <clears throat> they, are, they are, I think, long gone. I think most advisors operating on the IROC side of the business have evolved into more holistic planners Many of those planners are also, or those advisors are also licensed to provide um, insurance advice and, and sell insurance products to their, to, to their clients. And I think leveling that playing field and making it more clear to the client, I think is a really important thing for us to continue to consider. Yeah, Chris, I'll, I'll just add to that as well. And, and uh, yeah, certainly that has been my experience on the IROC side, so regardless on the investment side, right? And, and again, there's study after study that from a client perspective, uh, clients are looking for, uh, you know, one individual or one team or one firm to be able to manage all aspects of their financial life. And so I'll be on the insurance side of things, including the insurance side of things, including the, uh, in, including the investment side of things and, and all other aspects of their financial life as well. I mean, there's, uh, you know, no, no true desire here to have uh, five or six professionals trying to, to compete with each other and weigh in with each other, uh, you know, as it relates to if I'm the client, uh, my, uh, you know, my, my financial plan. And, and so this ability to integrate here and to really carry on, I think it's something that's truly in the client's best interest for sure. And they're looking for it. And that was a great point. Uh, thank you, Philip, and thank you, Chris. It, it, it's a great point to, and I swore to myself, and and I told everybody on LinkedIn that I would not talk about client-focused reforms. But if we do look at where we are, where we, what we have from CFRs, which is uh, things that have changed uh, the approach to how we have how we have done things suitability hasn't changed but you know we've got some some tweaks there but one of the big ones which and i'm focusing on chris's comment on on leveling the playing field is to remove that that concern confusion where do i go who am i dealing with what can my person do and make that client outcome and experience identical you know we have a clue from from our from the regulators and that clue comes in two words called misleading communications the desire uh, clearly is to uh, remove these challenges from clients where they're wondering exactly what can my person do, who am I dealing with, and why am I dealing with them? And, and this amalgamation will take a, a huge step forward to, to leveling that playing field. So that was, a, that was an excellent comment, Chris, and thank you for that. So next slide, please. So for now, where, where are we? Well, IROC, as we've, as we've discussed, you're, you're limited to what, uh, what we noted above, which is the uh, principal agent model as well as the employee-employer model. So in other words, you can't, you can't really do anything. Nothing's changed there. Um, there are some very limited workarounds, which are cumbersome. I don't want to talk about them here. They, they, they lack the elegance of, uh, of the incorporated professional. 
but uh, but they are in place um, and they do work, but they're they're limited in their availability and applicability. For MFDA registrants, you uh, you've had the ability to redirect your commissions for years, uh, which is great, good for you. Um, historically, there has been some uncertainty there, which I think the regulator acknowledges in, in uh, the bulletin that we'll talk about in a second. And, um, and it's always wise uh, to consider where things are going with, uh, with your taxation authority. So next slide, please. So what's on deck? Well, we've, uh, we've kicked it around already. We have SRO consolidation coming, uh, whether we like it or not. So by December 31st, 2022, uh, the MFD and the I and IROC will consolidate and amalgamate to form a new SRO. Uh, I think everybody's wondering what it's going to be called, who the president is and CEO is going to be. We have a board of directors that's been uh, that's been released already, so we know that much. But that is coming. Um, directed commissions is high up on the list in terms of something that is going to be, have to be tackled by the new SRO. So we know that that's coming. Um, and given the disparity of approaches, this is something that really needs to be dealt with very quickly, because as Chris said, you're, you're going to just take the problem of having the MFDA being able to do one thing, IROC being able to do another, and consolidate that under one, uh, under one roof, so to speak, you're still going to have the same problem. So that, that, uh, that, uh, that's, that item certainly needs to be squared off quite quickly uh, if, if we are to see the, the level playing field that, uh, that we're looking for. Uh, next slide, please. And, and this is really just for reference purposes. This is the uh, staff notice that was published by uh, CSA members 25404 uh, that deals with the uh, deals with SRO consolidation and where we're going. They've specifically articulated their position on harmonizing the directed commissions issue. There's a directed commissions working group that is working on this. And I've included these next two slides just to point out the CSA's notations on this issue. Next slide, please. Um, which can be taken away. I think the slide deck is going to be available, but here we have them commenting that the tax status of individuals, and forgive me, I'm going to read this, uh, the tax status of individual registrants who use a directed commission arrangement is unclear. A corporation that does not carry on business for which commissions are paid and merely acts as a conduit may not be able to achieve the, uh, the same desired outcome for tax purposes. So that's, that's back to our conversation about the corporation under the directed commission model is not actually licensed versus the professional corporation model where it is. So I leave that with you to consider. Uh, next slide, please. I think we're at the end here. So what happens next? Well, we're expecting a, uh, a new SRO to uh, be welcomed into the new world. Maybe it'll be a January baby, um, the first January baby in Canada, and uh, that will be at the beginning of next year. Uh, the expectation is for MFTA registrants to enjoy, uh, to continue enjoy, to enjoy uh, directed commissions pending what happens with the directed commissions learning group. And I'm just, I'm just a commentator here, a speculator like everyone else. I'm not uh, privy to any information. Uh, the in income tax uncertainty um, or the the lack of clarity, as we just uh, as we just highlighted, I think that's significant. I think that that's something that if I put my compliance hat on, and I say what what keeps me up at night as a CCO or as a UDP, well, I don't want my registrants to be stressed. Um, I certainly don't want them to have financial stress. And if they're being chased by a taxing authority they're going to be stressed. And that's not good for them. It's not good for clients. It's not good for the dealer. So that is something that is, is, is at the top of my mind as a commentator here. And uh, it's, it's, it's definitely going to be a competitive issue. The moment one firm puts their toe in the water and says, yep, we're going to offer this, you're going to have an enormous amount of pressure from, from domestic firms, meaning firms where I presently practice saying, hey, I can do this across the street. Why can't I do it here? So with that, I think, uh, Chris, you've uh, got a comment. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think the important point there for me in that slide, Sean, is, is to the, the term enjoy the status quo. Um, I'm not sure how many people are going to be enjoying the status quo in the event that the tax authority comes back and reassesses taxpayers that have directed commissions into um, another corporation. Um, and I think it gets back to the, 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 the comment that you made earlier as, you know, former CCO and, and not wanting your, your uh, you know, approved persons to be, to be stressed. Um, I, I think it's even more than that, because I think that in the event that there is an aggressive position taken by a tax authority and advisors that have been doing this for a long time get reassessed and are subject to penalties and interest, um, uh, and, 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 and I think it, then it leads into, um, you know, 
questions about fit and proper. If I, if I have an, a, an advisor that's provided great service to a network of, uh, of, our, of our clients over the course of time, and as a result of an aggressive stance by a tax authority, they owe a few hundred thousand dollars, um, that, that's going to create a real issue. Um, you know, will we put them under close supervision or strict supervision? Uh, it talks to the fit and proper test. Um, and I think it's something that, again, my underlying point in all of this is we're about to have a new rule book. <clears throat> Let's measure twice and cut once and fix this issue once and for all. I agree. I think that's a great segue into uh, our sort of roundup here. And I know, Marshall, I see the little Q&A button is uh, blinking quite a bit. So I think we're going to have a lot of questions. But I, I, do, I do think that, Chris, that point is, is extremely well taken to, to, to highlight that, you know, the goal here is to, is to foster the industry. It's to make the industry better. That's that's what people like Chris, what people like Phil, like people like I do. You know, our our goal here is to strengthen the industry because when we have IROC notices like we saw yesterday, that does nobody any good, um, and it shakes the confidence in the industry. And we're here to deliver wealth care to clients at a time when everybody knows that they need it most. Uh, during periods of volatility like we're seeing. So to remove these issues that are are bothersome and create drag on our registrant's ability to provide advice is the most important thing here. And that's why we're here, to create this conversation, to kick it around, and to, uh, and to make this place better. So uh, with that type of language, Marshall, over to you. Okay, we've got lots of, lots of questions. I'll lots try. of goodies group them as best that I can. I, I will say a few of them are around whether or not this webinar will be uh, is being recorded and available. It will be in a few days and you'll see it on our on our website. And uh, some of the questions have been answered through the ongoing uh, presentation material. So I'll try and stick to ones that weren't. But one general question is, is you know, kind of why are we still talking about this? It, it would, you know, if, if you take the assumption and maybe I'm pushing this too far that there's really no, um, this incorporation or the directed commission model doesn't really threaten or minimize investor protection in any way. Why hasn't this issue moved, moved forward at all? Uh, well, I can offer an opinion. Um, I think there's a couple of couple of answers here. Uh, one of which is to if we if we if we're just focusing our, our attention on on the um, the challenges of changing legislation. So if I want to go down the incorporated professional model uh, path, um, changing legislation at the provincial level is is not just snap my fingers and it's done. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to do that, and part of that energy is political energy. So uh, to to go forward, and this happened in uh, many, many years ago uh, when when the other professionals got it, doctors, dentists, and so on, you, you have this in, inevitably getting into the media and people saying, well, that's great. You know, the people who, these doctors and lawyers and dentists and whoever, these people who make tons of money already are going to make more money. That's really fair to me, the average person. So this, is, this isn't without its political risk. You know, the technical answer is, is it, is it hard to incorporate, uh, to build this legislation? No, the legislation has been built across the country. It's very straightforward and, and, and you can drag and drop it into whatever um, industry you like, legal, medical, dental, engineering, accounting, architects, et cetera. So there's no, there's no magic to doing it, uh, but there has to be some political will to do it. And uh, to, to the credit of the regulators, they're, they're saying, look, this isn't, this isn't our show. We can't, we can't push this, this cart uphill. Um, we have to make the statement. We have to request it. And then it actually has to get done. So that in and of itself takes time, but we do need political will. And I think there's an election coming up in Ontario, so I'm not sure that's a that's a campaign platform that uh, anybody wants to uh, uh, hitch their cart to. But that would be my explanation. I I and, think you hit the nail on the head there, Sean. I think that I mean you're right. There is I don't know if there's the political will for there to be a perceived benefit for financial advisors. Um, I, I think the other thing though that I think is important to note is I mean we got to this. Uh, point in time where um, we are talking about a new SRO, we are talking about a, a common rule book for all client-facing advisors long-term. Th this was a result of 
the industry, you know, pushing um, what they thought was in the best interest of the clients. Like this, this is just one aspect of why, uh, you know, this consolidated SRO uh, is, is a good idea. But, but, it, but there was a lot of other pieces to that in terms of reducing the amount of client confusion, you know, a, a client walking into their, their local bank and dealing with a mutual fund salesperson at the branch, and developing a relationship. And we've spent all of this time with client focused reforms and the client relationship model and better job of transparency in terms of costs and compensation. And over the course of that relationship, they decide to put, um, you know, an individual security into their, into their portfolio. They have to close their account. They have to move to another um, institution or another registrant within the same institution. And, and clients think that that's crazy and they lose all of their performance reporting. It has to start again. So this is just one aspect of, um, I think, the CSA doing the right thing and saying, OK, look, we, we haven't looked at this for a long time. Let's look at it. And, and like I continue to say, let's measure twice and cut once. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, part just to close that conversation from from the, the, the nerdy compliance professional that we all are, my desire is like, let's just stop talking about this. Let's put it to bed. It's not a complicated issue. Be done with it once and for all. And look, advisors will have the choice. Do I want to incorporate? Does it make the most sense to me? Yes or no? Fill your boots. It, it, it changes nothing otherwise. So let's just stop the conversation because it's, it's exhausting, to be perfectly honest with you. And let's just put it aside as an issue, solve it. And then, hey, here's your opportunity. Just like, just like a physician, just like a lawyer. Do you want to incorporate? Some may say yes, some may say no. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so Phil, I think this is a question more directed at uh, you. Is there a minimum suggested gross revenue amount or net revenue advisor share that would suggest exploring these options further when and if they become available? Yeah, Marshall, it's a, it's a great question. It really ties back to what I was saying before. This 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 may not be for everyone. There there are costs, there are complexities. You are you know additional tax returns and, and setting up structures and so on for a, a kind of a rule of thumb. And and uh, you know one one thing that that I believe is effectively if you are spending every dollar you're making, uh, yeah, the 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 benefits are limited. Right. Um, so I, I think this type of an approach is really for those advisors who are looking to grow, who really are looking to expand. I, I can tell you, I've, I've you know, talked with, uh, you know, advisors who in the past, one of the things that they've called out is, you know what, I think I incorporated too early. And, and so it has to be appropriate. It has to be. And, and whether this is there's an actual dollar amount, I can't say that, Marshall. Um, but like I say, that it, it does align to those advisors who are growing their business, growing their teams, and that's really where those efficiencies start to start to play. So a little bit of a you know down the middle answer there for you. But yeah, if, if you're newer or just spending every dollar you're making, uh, you've probably got other challenges or concerns on, that you should be addressing. I'm not sure that's just restricted to the newer advisors, Phil. Uh, yeah. under, under the no, heading, under point. the heading yeah. of uh, spending every dollar I make, mm -hmm. but I think I think you're yeah. in the the four or five hundred thousand dollar range at least. But the goal is to keep as much income in that company as possible because the moment you flush it out, um, I, I remember this from second year tax law. The the theory of integration applies, and really, you're no better off as a as a as an employed individual. In fact, you might be worse off. So. Uh, for the savers there who can keep the money in, invested in the company, it's it's better. That's my rule of thumb. Yeah, and the only thing that I would add to that is I, I completely agree um, with the one caveat that under the current tax rules, um, the lifetime capital gains exemption is a real thing um, and it's material for anybody that is you know takes this business seriously and is and is building something, irregardless of the pace that they're building it. But at some point that, you know, selling and, 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 and recognizing all of the hard work at some liquidity event down the road, I think is, is, is also an important point. Yeah, Sean, and it's a fair point, uh, you know, aligns to those who are growing. I'm forever the optimist here that says somebody starts off small and grows big, but not necessarily does it, does that always be the case or is, well, is that always the case? Chris, sure? Chris, yeah. Chris knows that I'm, I'm still a recovering chief compliance officer. And there are, there were times when, when we did get calls to get advances on paychecks. So it's, <laughs> it's not for the faint at heart. You, you want to keep your money in the company for sure. It, it, 
it's a noble business for sure. And one with, uh, and hence coming back to the comment around want to be a business owner here for sure. Yeah. Great. Okay. Um, we have a few questions around this theme, and I'm, <laughs> I think we've got to approach this a bit carefully. But um, the question is, do you ever realistically foresee a day that the bank-owned brokerages will permit their IROC advisors and brokers uh. to operate? Uh, yeah, so the, and then the other questions under that theme are, you know, if the banks aren't going to support this for, for their own reasons, you know, will, will this thing ever go forward? So. I, I think I'll take a stab at it. I'm not shy. Um, I, yep. I think that the I think that this is really just a, a choice of dealers, and and uh, and of organizations that own dealers. It's as simple as that. It's it's. I don't think we have to put the dividing line as to incorporate or not. I think it's a question of. Uh, it, it, it can be any particular issue and how, how, how a particular registrant firm wants to approach something. Some firms are very open to outside activities. Other firms are not. Uh, this is just one of those issues. If you want to do an outside activity here, the answer is no. It doesn't matter what it is. We don't want to spend any energy or resources allowing our people to do outside mm -hmm. activities. They may take mm -hmm. the same approach for incorporation, and that's, that's their prerogative to do. And I think the, the market will dictate I think the market will give us guidance in terms of, well, wait a second, if I can walk across the street and shave percentage points off my tax bill, why wouldn't I do that? Um, and I think the market will, will drive this conversation ultimately. Chris? Yeah, I was just going to add that I think that um, the, the fact that, you know, way back when, before there was even principal agent within an IROC channel, I think that that was the opportunity to push back if, if there was going to be no, it always has to be a certain way. And I mean, I'm, I'm not aware of, 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 of any bank owned firm that operates in a principal agent agreement. They're all employee employer. But I think that obviously this is a, this is a conversation that can only happen within a principal agent model, not an employer employer model. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, would this um, apply to an institutional salesperson? as an investment bank that receives bonuses and not commissions? Interesting question. Well, that is interesting. Um, I hadn't considered that, but I guess in yeah. theory, it, 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 uh, it should. It should be no different. I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm thinking there's, there's nothing that's jumping out at me that says it shouldn't. I would agree. I think it goes back to the nature of the relationship between the firm and the individual. Yep. Their principal yep. agent and they're carrying on capital market activity or investment banking services as, as part of that, then it should apply. Right. Okay. I wouldn't lead with that in terms of I'm not I'm not directing this to Chris, but I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, use that as my flagship model to advance uh, the benefits of incorporation to allow investment bankers to make more money. But uh, yes. that that might be even more political than I'd ever considered yes. and entertaining too. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I know we don't have, uh, none of us have a crystal ball, but there is a number of questions about whether or not um, this is going to happen, what sort of timeline it might happen within. But is it, is it safe to say that on just January 1, um, that although the, the two organizations will merge together, they'll still be, and Sean, you've alluded to it, there'll still be a lots of um, um, room for integration over the next couple of years after after that and uh, this might be one issue where there still is an unlevel playing field for a period of time after after the merger um anyway anyone's uh, thoughts on on that um will, will the mfda and iraq continue to operate after january 1 uh, with 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 different approaches to this issue I, I think my own personal opinion is if we're talking about January 1st, 2023, then absolutely there will be, a, you know, a, a different set of rules for former MFDA dealers as part of this, um, at this new SRO and, and former IROC dealers. But I think where we need to continue to put pressure on is this should not, does not need to be a three to five year process. I mean, we, Sean will cringe when I say this, but I mean, on the IROC side, the plain language rules, you know, those were really quick from when we started talking about it to when they were implemented. I think it was only 15 or so years. So I think we, we have a brand new rule book um, that has been um, and, and, and been updated. Um, I, I think we just need it as an industry to continue to put pressure to, again, 
a common rule book for all client facing advisors. And Sean, you, you mentioned about uh, election here in Ontario. I can assure you that I haven't heard this as an election platform uh, for any of the parties over the uh, over the next uh, or for this election for sure. So I think, I think Doug just wants to get reelected at this point. So yeah, yeah. Uh, Sean, you knew you were going to be asked about this, and when you mentioned workarounds for IROC registrants. <laughs> Uh, what uh, about how do, you to, how do you want to how do you want to respond to that? Well, what's it's, the, question? the question is uh, what are the workarounds? Well, we we know that there are, and and I'll I'll remind everyone that there um, there was a statement earlier on that these are just opinions, and this is certainly not yes. advice. But we yeah. we what we, what we know right now, and what the facts are, are that referral arrangements are permitted. We know that that's that's baked into 31103. So there are situations in particular with common clients, meaning insurance clients who are also securities clients that uh, can be referred from the insurance agent to the securities dealer to receive securities advice. So that is subject to, if that is subject to a referral arrangement, there's really nothing left to talk about. Um, it, 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 it is what it is. It works. Um, it's, it's not elegant. It's, it's, it's cumbersome and it, it's only, it's, it, it has limited applicability, but it, it has been known to be used, um, from time to time. Okay. Um, um, hmm. I'm not sure about this, but why can advisors working in the OSC PM world direct 100% of their commissions to a corp? I didn't know they could. Um, I, I hope that's an anonymous question. For their <laughs> it sake. is. It is. Okay. Yeah. Good, for, good for them. Uh, I didn't know they could either. Um, mm. they, I, I, I'm not familiar with that at all. And, and in fact, yeah. we've done work for groups that have been uh, audited by the by the by the provincial regulators, and they've come across those arrangements, and they've said they'd have they have to stop immediately. There are some local okay. orders um, that that have existed historically that have allowed that, but but those are those are few and far between. Right. Uh, you, yeah, the rest of the questions you. Um. um well, it lacks, uh, you want a thoughts on IROC dually licensed persons to use their life? That's what we just answered. I yeah. saw that one. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, we've a bunch of these have been answered already. Uh, Dave Banks, yeah, I think um, there's a few questions on Alberta. Uh, will the outcome likely apply nationally or can Alberta continue to not go along with the policy? I think Alberta and Saskatchewan um, in particular, they're waiting. Um, so I think that that's, uh, th that's something that, that everybody's just waiting for, for national um, for consistency. Okay. Um, yeah. Hearing you sort of answer this previously as a, as a PM, once I would, or, or an advisor, once I incorporate, would my sales assistants work under my corporation or still under the dealer payroll? I know we've had some discussion on that, but I just want to um, reiterate what was said earlier. I think there's a couple, and Philip can jump in here as well, but I've seen, I've seen different models and approaches there. I've seen approaches where the sales staff are, um, are employees of the dealer member. Uh, I've seen situations where the sales staff, hey, it's your business, go hire who you want to hire, go put up a shingle and rent space wherever you want to rent space or own property. It's it's your problem. Your license is sponsored through us and that's it. So I think beyond that, if those firms that do adopt or go down that path are typically very, um, are they're very independent minded in nature, which which really allow and provide choice to the advisor to, to structure their business as they wish. Yeah, and, and Sean, I, I would echo that. That's the experience that I have seen, uh, certainly. And that is, uh, you know, sales assistants, for example, uh, typically would be employees of the corp versus of, in this case, the dealer payroll or the firm or, or whoever. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I think you've also touched on this one, but I'll ask the question again. Will the sale of a book of business be treated differently if in a personal name or versus a, uh, in, a, in a, a corporation? 
uh, again, if uh, it, it could very well be treated very differently. Uh, Chris has mentioned the opportunity in terms of succession planning to, uh, if, if, I'm, if I'm an advisor who's at the end of my career, I've incorporated my company 30 years ago, there's a lot of value sitting in those shares. And I have, I want to bring on a partner who will eventually buy me out. Well, I think that's not, a, that's not an uncommon event outside of the securities world where you have an opportunity for the business owner to have that liquidity event versus uh, me selling my book and, and uh, held in my personal name uh, or held personally, pardon me, that, that attracts the very typical tax, tax outcomes, uh, whether this is structured as capital or income and, and over what period of time. Uh, but again, you know, it's a liquidity event, whether it's whether or not you're going to be able to take advantage of the QSBC shares. Um, uh, maybe the last question here, because we're just about at one o'clock. Um, would it be possible to earn insurance commissions and uh, advice investment directed commissions under the same corporation? So if you're dual, duly licensed. Um, I, I don't think there's anything prohibiting that. No, I think it yeah. happened. Chris, do, I think that happens now. It, yeah, I was going to say on the MFTA side, Typically, um, a lot of the directed commissions um, get directed to the company that actually holds that corporate life license. So that that does in fact happen. Okay. Okay, great. Okay. So I think we'll cap it off there. Thank you, um, Sean, Phil, and Chris for a great uh, discussion today. Um, this will uh, conclude our event. And uh, if you have any additional questions, you can email uh, uh, CSI at designations at CSI.ca. As mentioned, a replay of this event will be available in the coming days. And for more information on upcoming webinars, including our upcoming webinar on the Title Protection Act in Ontario uh, on June 22nd, please visit our, visit our website at CSI.ca. And once again, thank you everyone for attending, attending and have a great day. Thank you very much, Marshall. Marshall. Thank you.